kind of operation that incubate uh, so at incubate we are a software services company and uh, we basically sponsor the software craftsmanship community here um so uh, i want to actually just take a moment to reflect on what this community stands for um right so we are a group of people who really take craftsmanship to heart um we truly believe that that is how software should be built and it's important uh, uh to do it well right um so when 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 done right you're able to make more frequent releases you're able to have fewer bugs in production and work at a sustainable pace so you end up with a happier team happier users and happier customers uh yes so that that's what i wanted to say as context uh, vrushali would you want to add anything and maybe give a quick introduction as well sure sure thanks arui uh hi i'm rushali i am the founder of this community and also the founder of incubite um so to add to what aro he said right i think our topic today plays a huge part in in the how of software development and um, we've heard so very often that it's all about the flow right get into the flow um and not just when you're in a zen meditation practice but also when you're reading about lean processes or lean practices there's a lot of lot written about flow uh, master showed us a book that he has about it as well um so internalizing and implementing flow in our lives helps us deliver uh, value to our end users a lot more consistently and uh, we're very excited master to have you here and talk to us about this topic so thank you so much for for coming um we had sandro here actually your co-founder for for uh, the launch of this community and now we have you so thank you again and with that i'll just hand it over to you um if you want to start with a quick introduction nash um thank you shali i'm very happy to be here as well um and excited um so yeah i'm as you as you said i'm one of i'm the other co-founder who doesn't do as many talks <laughs> so if you've had sandro then don't expect too much <laughs> expect a bit less um so yeah i'll be talking about slow so flow so could we should we get started or yeah so can i i'll stop sharing my screen okay excellent and i'll share my screen all right okay so actually just one second i think i was using two screens but i was thinking about um let me i've not used this before so the both screens have disappeared but let me just start again <laughs> I, i normally use meet and no there it's, it's much easier all right okay so let me just move this back into the screen because i don't think teams on mac can handle two screens okay so if i present can you see this here it's just yep. coming up mash yeah yes. much better okay cool yeah so okay cool all right so as uh, rishali said i'll be talking about flow it's a it's a name or a word that gets thrown about everywhere in life and also in software um we we talk about the kind of the personal state and we also talk about flow in lean it's actually a a um a principle in xp as well so when when i started seeing a lot of these uh, the usage of this word everywhere i thought to myself is is it one of those those principles that actually lies right at at the base of what we do and there are many others and i'll talk about those as well but before we go into all this let me start with a question ooh yes okay so the question is are you are you happy at work right so sure you can say well i am because you know it makes me good money i see my friends there's a social aspect to it and all those things are fair 
but are you really happy working? Are you ha getting that optimal experience when you when you are sat down doing the work that you need to do, right? And the optimal experience is actually at the basis of the psychological state of flow, right? So the way you describe optimal experience is is it's a it's an activity that you engage in where you get this timeless feel, right? So you are you don't notice the time go by and each action flows into the next action and you get this deep enjoyment from the activity, right? So can you say that about the work that you do on a daily basis? Do you get this kind of deep enjoyment from, from the work that you do? And I'm not just talking about the, the coding aspect, right? The work involves everything from meetings, from um, you know, talking to your colleagues from pairing and all these kind of things. Do you get this kind of deep enjoyment, right? So that's the question. And if your answer is is yes, then you're probably lying to yourself because actually the the activities that we engage in, they are not the kind of activities where optimal experience is there by design. In fact, optimal experience is more there by design in certain hobbies that we do. So for example, you might be, um, you know, uh, you might be doing a, a, a sport that you enjoy, right? And you get optimal experience in there. You know, you, you don't notice the time go by, you're in deep enjoyment. Or if you play music, you're playing your favorite instrument. These kind of things have optimal experience within them by design. The work that we do is, doesn't have that by design. It doesn't just happen. Is something that you have to have to cultivate, right? So, so in this example, this guy is really enjoying enjoying himself. But this is a typical activity that is where optimal experience is by design, right? And he is in a state of flow. And I will describe later what that means, right? Sorry. Okay. So, in order to understand what flow actually means. First, we, we look at, as, as I mentioned to you earlier, there are certain uh, concepts in our world that when we see, we get this um, idea of self-similarity, right? And self-similarity is, is something, it's true even in nature, that when something actually um, is, it works, something works well, they, it happens at for all sorts of different levels. You, you keep seeing it over and over again at different levels. And that's why the word flow keeps getting bandied about as well. So for example, coupling and cohesion is a thing that you see often right at the method level. You see it at the class level. You see it at the system services level. You see it at the team level. And you see it at organizations level as well, right? It's one of those first principles and get, that gets talked about over and over again at different levels. Fast feedback is another one. Systems thinking is another, another kind of concept that you keep hearing over and over again. And flow. And there are many others as well. But today we are going to be talking about flow, right? And the way I see these things are they are almost like lenses that you, you use to see the same things from a different perspective. And like any different lens, it will give you, it give it give the same things that you have a different color, or it will give it a different kind of focus, right? So, so they are tools for you to see your practices, for you to understand when something should be uh, adapted, when something is good, and also when that same th thing is not good or it, it's not suitable for that particular purpose, right? The first principles are the things that people use to come up with other aspects. Like, for example, in software development, you know, you can describe the solid principles through coupling and cohesion, right? Those are the first principles that were used to come up with these kind of secondary level principles. And coupling and cohesion is always um, applicable, whereas solid principles are applicable in different places and not in others. Right, so that's why they are, I can refer to them as first principles. And flow is one of those first principles, right? And so, 
as uh, as we were talking about this earlier, floor is mentioned in many different um, materials or um, in in academia, both within our industry and outside our industry. So you've got the the psychological state that's flow, and and it's an excellent book written by Mehale um, on on happiness, right? How flow enables happiness, right? And this goes back to my question to you: Are you happy at work? Right. And then the, the same word appears in product development and the same word appears as a principle in extreme programming. Right. And actually, the word means, you know, one thing flows into other. That's why they use the word flow. Right. It's the basis of the psychological state and action flows into the next action It's the basis of product development. One phase flows into the next phase and same with extreme programming. Right. So actually, at the very base of this, it's the same idea. So then you get this self-similarity, right? You, you then have to start thinking about, okay, well, it's actually a tool that I can use to bring focus into the things that I need to, to do and see what applies, what doesn't apply, what's important, what's not important. So, as I said, let's look at flow then. Let's see how we can use flow to design our optimal experience, right? Even though we have said, right, that we software development in itself is not a flow activity by design. It's not inherently a flow activity, but we can design our environment, our ways of working, our own attitudes in a way that actually we can be in this state for, for either much more frequently or all the time, right? And it's really important because it's actually about enjoying our work, right? Because if you think about it, you know, you work you know, at least eight hours a day. That's half your waking hours during the week. That's a lot of life to spend on something that you don't enjoy, that you are not happy with in a very intrinsic way, right? So it is really our business to design our optimal experience on our place of work. Okay, so looking back at Flow, Flow has a um, a bunch of enablers, right? So this guy, he's you know he's engaged in a state of Flow. We can, it's almost typical kind of picture, you know, uh, you know, you type Flow and you'll see this kind of picture. And so, what are the constituent parts? Although we've decided that actually this activity is inherently Flow inducing. And software development is not inherently as a whole activity flow inducing, but actually you can take this and take it apart into, into the concepts that are at work here. And then you can start applying those same concepts into our work and see how we can take the benefit or at least some of the benefit of what this man is enjoying, right? So the first thing is clear goal. And by the way, these things are not going to be groundbreaking. You're not going to see something absolutely new. As I said, you will see them from a different lens, from a different focus. Right? So a clear goal, right? So this person has a very clear goal. This is a flow inducing activity. So, you know, he needs to make this vase from clay and he knows exactly what it, it must look like. He either has a drawing. He has a, um, a in his imagination. He knows exactly what will this, the finished product will look like, or he has a, another similar piece that he he is replicating. Right. So it's a very clear goal. He knows exactly how much time he has. He knows the materials. He knows what he needs to make. He has fast feedback to the point where every action is so intertwined with the other that it's all one thing. You know, he has this hand, eye, mind combination, right? So he's observing, his mind is has this imagination of what it's going to look like that's constantly being refined from what it is currently looking like. That's informing the hand that is using the tool to shape the thing. He understands the materials perfectly. They are at the right consistency. He's cost constantly getting this feedback and the feedback loop is so tight that it's one action. It's not many different phases, it's just one action. So the faster the feedback, you, the faster you can make the feedback, the more flow inducing 
the activity you get into. He has this sense of control. He is in control of his environment. He's in control of what, what he's doing. He has a high level of confidence that he will achieve what he needs to achieve. Now, things can happen. The sense of control is actually a mental state. It's not, a, it's not true in reality because many things can happen, right? Someone can knock at the door. There might be an emergency. They might, the sprinklers might come on. Or actually, he might make a mistake and ruin it all right at the very end, right? So it's not that things can, can't go wrong, but in his mind, he believes that he, can, he will make what he needs to make, right? And of course, there is this, this focus, right? Even if his mobile phone um, rings, his hands are quite dirty to pick it up. But he has this absolute focus on this thing. You can imagine there's not much else he's thinking about. You know, the, the activity, it's challenging. You know, one wrong move can make the thing uh, ruin, right? So he has this absolute focus. But, but on top of that, he has this challenge skill balance. He knows that he has the skill to be able to achieve what he needs to achieve. The challenge that is presented in front of him is well met by the, by the skill that he has. Right. So these are the five things that I would call flow enablers. Right. So now that we've kind of taken it down into these constituent parts, how do we reconstruct the kind of things that we need to do to enable flow or at least get into flow states as often as we can, both at the individual level and at the team level? Right. So. Let's talk about the clear goal, first of all, right? So how do we make sure that the goal that we have is clear, right? We, so my advice is to start with values. When someone jo joins Codurance, um, I always do a session um, every few weeks where I basically, to all newcomers, I, I go through our values, right? So professionalism, effectiveness, excellence, and pragmatism, right? We, and they are just words, but it's how we describe them and how we align with each other that matters, right? They can then be the basis for every other decision that we make. They are the basis for the agreements, and they are also the basis for resolving any conflicts that we get, right? But those are not the only values. You got the ones at the bottom are actually XP values, yeah? And you may have other values as well. It's good to align yourself on the values, both yourself. What are your values? Make them explicit to yourself. Understand, may, internalize them to the point that your actions and every action and every behavior is guided by them. That's when they are your values, right? But make sure that you actually do cultivate them, you understand them, and align them with the rest of your team, right? This goes a long way towards creating a clear goal for yourself and your organization. And then align the goals at different levels, right? If you, different people that have an impact on what you do may have different goals, but that's fine, right? A business has economic goals. They will, you know, it's about profit and loss and it's about product and it's about a lot of things. They, they might even care about the team and people's happiness, those kind of things, but only because they wanna be profitable and they think happy teams are effective in terms of those economic variables. Your team may have other uh, goals as well. You know, these are the four key metrics, but there might be other aspects. At Codurance, we have uh, happiness as actually a team goal. And, and there is an automated survey that goes out every few weeks to every single individual. And they are, the team itself is responsible for managing the happiness, right? It's a thing that they must control, right? So again, there are certain goals that you can set up um, and you will also have personal goals. You know, you want to build certain skills. You you want to progress your career in a certain way. Right? So you cannot be in a place where the goals, the personal, the team, and the business goals conflict. If they conflict, you need to align them. Because if they conflict, something is going to win, probably at a personal level, not your goal is going to win. right? But again, as we said, we need to have that clear goal 
at the personal level. In order to get those personal level clear goals, they need to align with the rest of the organization. So spend some time actually making sure that those goals are aligned and they are explicit. So the next thing is about fast feedback. Again, it's not a groundbreaker, right? We all know that fast feedback is good, but how good is it? And what kind, what do we mean by fast feedback? When you actually look at uh, any organization, it's a, it's a bit of a relative term, fast, faster than what, right? So, but we need to understand it from this lens, like what, what fast feedback means for me to get into flow inducing activities and for my team to do the same, right? If I show you this, um, you know, how fast is your develop, deploy, verify cycle? And you might say, people might be thinking of different things. You might be thinking about the, your TDD cycle, right? In that case, it might be very quick. You know, I write my test, I make it, make it pass. That's the develop phase in this case, uh, or rather implement. And then when I run it, te the test is deployed. I don't even see it as a separate activity and my test verifies. So it's seconds, right? But that's not what I'm talking about. That's the minimum, right? Or in a flow inducing activity. Actually, you need to think about this man again, right? What is his test? How is he verifying what he's verifying? Well, he's observing the whole system. Every action that he makes has an impact, changes the whole thing that he is changing, and he's seeing it all the time. So if you look at this kind of way of working, it's easier in front end because you can either mock the back end, which is less tangible. The front end is the most tangible aspect. So your mind, eye, hand is actually in a better unison there. And the languages are, tend to be dynamic. As soon as you make the change with, with the IDs and development environment nowadays, you don't even have to refresh your browser. You know, you see the change happening. You have a TDD flow on one side and you see the buttons, the fields, the colors, the you know styling appear on the on your uh, the other side on, in the browser, right? And this is a good flow. You know, you have the TDD flow, but you're also verifying the whole system. Maybe you mock the other aspects, so you uh, or the back end, for example. But that's the less tangible part. So maybe it's it's it, uh, Seeing, observing the whole system is best, but seeing its tangible parts is a good compromise. When it comes to backend development, we are in a worse situation because often the thing that we mock is the intangible part. Uh, sorry, the tangible part, and we are working with the intangible. So when we, uh, when I was at uh, investment banking, we worked in the back office. We were creating systems that were would take feeds from the front office systems. And in most cases, I was so surprised to find out when I first started, was that the developers didn't even know what the front, end, uh, front office systems looked like. They just had these uh, message uh, standards, message for, they weren't even standards, they were kind of agreed message formats. And they were, you know, the way they were testing their system was, you know, pushing those into queues and seeing what comes out. And that's okay but they did not see the whole system run in their own in their own uh, environments so again they are losing a big aspect and they thought that wasn't important because you know some kind of integration would catch it and so on and it was fine you know people were developing and that's okay but it's not a flow inducing activity so what i did was i made sure that everybody had the trade capture systems on their machines. So they could hook them up quite quickly. And the more they use those trade capture systems, the, the, they became experts at capturing trades. And they would do it so quickly and so often that it no longer became a chore, but they were able to then start seeing the system working as a whole rather than a single part and with no real affinity to, to what's happening upstream. Again, 
you know, you can get find your ways around it and never have to install that front office system. But actually, it's important. It's important because of this image on, on the right. It's a flow inducing activity. You're seeing the thing as a whole, the way it's meant to be used, and you're constantly getting that feedback, that fast feedback from the whole thing, right? So if you don't have that fast feedback in your systems, the your TDD cycles are not enough. They will give you fast feedback, but at a level. You need more feedback at different levels, all the way from where the system is observed from in its natural state. So when I was talking about levels, it's clear in XP, right? I mean, this is a very, very old, well, very old in uh, IT terms, uh, diagram from XP, the feedback loops, the ever kind of tightening feedback loops, loops all the way from the release plan into the code, right? You've got seconds with pair programming, minutes with unit tests, pair negotiations, so on, right? Again, the concepts and these building blocks or flow enablers appear everywhere, and there's a reason, right? So use these practices, but looking at it from a different lens brings more focus or a different kind of focus. I mean, this is related to your happiness at work. You have the same kind of thing in DevOps. These are the three ways of DevOps, right? It starts creating flow from left to right in the first way, amplifies the feedback feedback loops so that you really understand what is being fed, fed, fed back, and then creates this, this ever tightening feedbacks within that, right? And it's all about fast feedback. Again, that's not a coincidence, but again, you can use it from, from this lens to see that actually this is helping you create flow inducing activities at your work. Okay. So sense of control. So sense of control is, is a funny one. It's actually very, very tightly related to fast feedback, right? Imagine you drive in a car and the, when you turn the wheel, there is a five second delay from when you turn to when the car actually turns, right? You'll, you'll say the car, car is out of control or you have no control of the car and you'd be mad to sit in that car. You wouldn't sit in that car, right? So why do we always accept ever increasing um, delays in our feedback loops? I, we have an internal project that we, we maintain, and I keep an eye on how quickly the bills happen. And they're normally about three. Uh, so every time you, you deploy something in, in master, it goes into the product, uh, releases into production. And from three minutes, I saw one commit that took it to 15. And I thought, so I spoke to the person who made the change and said, well, what exactly, what was the trade off here? And he said, well, you know, I dockerized it. And I said, well, you know, it's a in in-house system. What was the problem that you were trying to solve with Docker? And he said, no problem. It's just that Docker is a good idea. So I asked him, is Docker a, a better idea than fast feedback and a sense of control? Obviously not. And this, again, this is going back to the first principles. You know, a lot of things seem like good ideas, but you know, when you start thinking about it from different lens, you start getting clarity on whether that's applicable in that situation or not, right? This is another thing to look at from that lens, like sense of control, right? You've got these silo teams, we often get them, right? And when we work in this particular way, we are actually losing control at many, many levels because things are kind of coming from left to right. They're being thrown over the fence. There are distinct phases, product team stories, you know, those stories, there, there's a lot of refinement that's already been done. Dev teams, if they're lucky, they'll get the stories. Sometimes they get the tasks to do and they might be doing X number of tasks and another team might be doing the others to actually build the whole story. So they don't even know what this really does. And then the QA team is, you know, just testing stuff, but they're looking at the story, but if something goes wrong, 
they have to go back to other teams to discuss and it's not really that uh, conducive or the communication is not that good. And then, you know, the typical ops team where you throw the release over to their end and they complain about it, right? Now, if you look at this, it's wrong at many levels, but you lose control at so many and everybody is losing control. That's where the idea of the whole team in XP comes from, right? It's about giving yourself more control. And it's about, uh, it's about being able to actually do something when you see that something needs to be done rather than having to jump through these organizational si silos, right? So again, look at it from this lens. What, what do you see? You know, this, the, here you have this lack of self-control and it's not a holistic activity. You don't have that tight feedback loop that induces flow, right? And this is again, impacting your happiness at work, right? It's not just about, oh, there's another better way of doing it. No, that the, this way of doing it is actually creates unhappy people. Okay. So the next one is about focus. Right, so focus is an interesting one because actually, if I was to show you this picture, you got, which one is more true for us? Is it the bottom left, you know, the sole programmer or, or the top right, you know, we are sat amongst many people uh, working and often interrupted. And I would say, you know, uh, unless you someone wants to disagree and if they do then you know maybe you're doing some hacking at the middle of the night but usually it's the one on the top right that's where, where we are but actually looking back to this guy he's on the bottom left right it's a soul activity focus is natural you know no one's in, in interrupting you and you know you are pretty much uh, on your own and that's not what we do. So does that mean that we can't focus, right? So there, there are two aspects to this, looking at it from, from the flow lens. One is, think back about that car, the driver sat in the car. You know, if you drive, you'll know this quite well, that you, you are focused on the road. The movements that you make to control the car are almost automatic. I mean, you understand them very well, and that's where the skill comes in, yeah? You have the goal in front of you. In order to get towards that goal, your hand is making and mind are working almost without your awareness to some level, right? And you are in this almost uh, a mental state where you are focused on, on one thing, but you also have this awareness that extends everywhere you know you your there's you, kind of your peripheral vision is seeing and registering every car and if you're an experienced driver you will very quickly know if someone is driving erratically nearby even though you're not looking at them right and this is an extended awareness aspect of focus so focus doesn't just mean leave me alone i'm doing this thing it means i'm doing this thing and i have this heightened awareness of my environment and everybody around me, right? So that's one thing. So cultivating that kind of focus, but which has this heightened awareness. But there it comes the other problem with that is that if you have that heightened awareness, you are susceptible to be interrupted quite often. And if you are often interrupted, you know, your focus will waver. And, the, and this also, interruptions are kind of breaking that flow. So how do you manage that? So I'll give you an example. I used to have a boss that loved to come talk to me every time he thought of something. And, you know, once or twice a day is okay, but this would happen quite frequently during the day, right? So he would come in, he'd have an idea, and I'd have to break my focus to speak to him. So in the end, I thought enough was enough. And I put a Pomodoro timer on my screen and I said to him, when it's uh, orange or red, you can't come to my desk. So, and when it's green, you know, 
come and and I'll be I'll be free. I explained to him the Pomodoro technique. He liked it a lot, and it was quite funny because he used to kind of look from far just to see whether I had a kind of a a, a red or an orange marker on my my screen so that he so that he could leave me alone, right? And the same thing can happen with the uh, teams as well. We used to one of the teams I worked in. We had um, uh, application support coming to us all the time and just picking anybody that they thought would be remotely kind of available or friendly to ask about a particular defect or, or a particular, particular thing. And again, that was kind of interrupting everyone and the whole team. And in this situation, we actually designated one person. We had a flag on his desk and we told everybody that this person is the hand. And, you know, when you come to talk to the team, you must talk to the hand, right? And and that, again, frees up for others to focus. While, so teamwork, you can actually protect each other and in order to, to allow the team members to, to stay in those focus states because it is important. Like a lot of people say, you know, the zone, you shouldn't get into the zone because then you are antisocial, this kind of thing. Well, if the zone is about focus with this heightened awareness, then you should get into it. And then you should cultivate your environments around you to be able to get into it. This is again related to your happiness, right? Not being able to get into the zone is going to make you unhappy. It's going to make you bored with the work and frustrated. So again, it's important. So when someone says don't get into the zone because it's a bad thing, uh, you're antisocial, well, actually, it's not, but I think what they think of zone and what, what actually is are two very different things. But again, looking at it from this lens can help you see it yourself and explain it to others. So um, that we talk about cognitive load as well when it comes to focus. This uh, picture on the left you might have seen from Team Topology's book um, where it tries to reduce the cognitive load of individual teams, you know. That's why unstructured monoliths are a bad thing because, you know, you to do one thing, you have to look at all sorts of other things. Same as a team that can do everything is constantly context switching and the focus goes away, right? But even when you talk about, you know, the, on the right, you've got this, the BC stands for bounded context. You know, when you start creating microservices and those kind of things, if the change is coming in so that it fits into certain microservices that are owned by different teams, you're in the same problem. Your cognitive load is high. You are talking to all the teams all the time. So again, focus is an important aspect. You need to cultivate it both personally within the team and across teams. And finally, the challenge skill balance, right? Now, if you look at this diagram, this is basically shows what you feel when when you're when you are have a specific level of challenge and and what kind of skill would match it. And if you're low skilled, if you look on the left, if you have if you don't have the skill in the work that you're doing, you're either in apathy, which means you don't care, you're worried, or worse, you're anxious, right? You don't want to be in this place. But on the right, when your skill levels are high, you're either in relaxation, control, or in the state of flow when the challenge and the skill are balanced, right? But any one of those three states on the right is, is okay, you know, as long as you're moving in and out of them. So this is a thing, the challenge you may not be able to always control, but you can control your skill levels, right? So think about uh, making sure that you are skilled. And this, both at work and in your own time, is important. That's why the software craftsmanship communities exist, right? You are trying to move towards the high skill, right? How it's done is as important as getting it done, right? So make sure that your skill levels meet the challenges that you have, because that's when you will come into the flow state. So finally, these are the building blocks, and we probably can't get into the state that these kind of activities like making a pot or playing the guitar or these kind of things 
they are naturally flow inducing. But we can get into these states frequently and we can be much, much happier at work. If we take the constituent parts of flow, the psychological state, combine it with the aspects of flow that exist in development processes to design an environment for us personally and for our teams. Thank you. Questions? Thanks a lot, Mesh. Uh, I can't even imagine how hard it is to deliver a talk when you don't see people nodding and giving you fast feedback. <laughs> <So> <laughs> <laughs> talk fast feedback while you're getting none. Uh, uh, and it's awesome. Thanks a lot. Uh, and, and I actually did write down a question and you somewhat addressed it when uh, you talked about the fact that when I see a person who's in flow, I really like focusing or zone. I really see that if it was a developer, then he'll have a different picture who has a headphones uh, and maybe looking, you know, looking into a screen and uh, focusing. How does it go on when it, it has to do with collaboration as well? So it's not just being aware of what your surrounding is, but let's say you're working as a pair, working as a team. Uh, how do you get flow for more than one person together? So one of the things, for example, in our team we did was we synchronized our um, Pomodoros, right? So we said that we will have, so you we were using a, an app actually that helped us to, at the team level synchronize the Pomodoros. So Pomodoro, if people don't know, is a technique where you spend about 25 minutes in pure concentration and you take a five minute break. And then you take a longer break after a few more Pomodoros. So this cycle that you follow, where you actually concentrate, break yourself out, concentrate again. And it, it helps a lot, especially when you are pairing and in the team kind of thing, and we would synchronize those. So the break times were were similar. So you could then, and it would be a natural way of interacting because you're taking your mind off the, the, the thing at work and you become more social. So everyone kind of sits back and starts talking. So that's one way of doing it. The headphone thing, you know, like a lot of people say like headphones are bad, right? I don't think so personally, because if you have a good relationship with your team, and they can just tap on your shoulder and not feel bad about it. And you have made it very explicit that headphones are there, but think that they are not. Then it's fine. But the other aspect is, do you have heightened awareness? Because one thing that you may not get is like someone else is talking about certain things and, you know, you kind of working on your thing, but, you know, like that subconscious is hearing. You know, you're also looking at postures and all those kind of things. Those things, you know, with like kind of that osmosis aspect might be getting lost, right? So in a team environment is, you know, of course you can use headphones if that makes you happier and, and makes you, helps you concentrate, but also think that there is a compromise there to some level, but they're not simply bad. I mean, you know, it's not... It's a team. It's not. It's not a dictatorship. <laughs> I not necessarily about flow, but you mentioned the heightened awareness and things going around you. Uh, and I distinctly remember, like Francesco working from Italy, and Rich and every other person in the team keeping him on the speakerphone all the time. So even if there was a call going on, he would listen in, or he would just talk as if he was physically. Uh, as if he was physically there. But now that everyone's remote, what, what do you think about those? How, how do you have, how do you get the heightened awareness of what's happening in different things? It's, it's, it's So yeah, that, that is difficult. Actually, we have some teams, for example, our Barcelona team always has a Zoom room that they have on. And you can mute it or, you know, but you're, you're all, always seeing who's there. And if people want to just have a quick chat, they can just chat on it and you'll hear it. Or they can go into a, um, a breakout room. Now, it took them a while to, to, to get used to it, but they still do it. They've been doing it for over a year, so it seems they like it. Uh, so, but yes, it's it's not easy when you are not co-located 
and working in these remote environments, certain things like this kind of awareness suffers. Uh, so then you need to be a bit more um, mindful of that and create activities like frequent breaks together and those kind of things where you can come in, have a cup of tea and, you know, just chew the fat over anything, right? And often the, the conversation turns towards work if you're enjoying it, right? Any other questions? Um, I think I just request people to uh, post questions, but I see someone was going to just ask one. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, it was me actually. Uh, hi, Les. Uh, great talk, by the way. Uh, Thank I you. had a small question uh, regarding goals. So, clear goals. I mean, how do you define clear? Like, what is the metric? I mean, it's, if it, as a developer, it can be uh, maybe a user story, maybe center this button. So, uh, like, but that's a very specific thing. But on a higher level, say, we are starting a project. At that time, how do you actually define a clear? Do you have any tips for this? Yeah, actually, I, I do. In fact, um, the book that I am uh, showed earlier, I don't know if you were around, uh, but you know, you don't have to look at that book, but it's uh, identifying a goal is actually the first step in, in Lean. So Lean has five steps. It's identify goal, visualize your value stream, create flow, uh, and then it's about there's another one I forget, and then it's uh, seek perfection. Or yes, create, pull, and seek perfection. Now, how you identify a goal at a business level is like in lean terminology, they talk about economic variables, right? So it's about profit and loss. It's about certain amount of number of users. It's about those kind of things, right? So they, those are the goals that the business will have, yeah? Now, Based on those goals, they might make a uh, bet that this product will help us achieve those goals. And often when when it comes to developers, they don't actually bother telling us about the actual goal. They just tell us that this product is the goal. And the product is not the goal. It's the means to the goal that really is. So you identify that. So that's why I, I wrote economic variables from a business goals point of view. See what is making the business tick, right? And can you measure it? And how are they measuring it? But then at the team level, you will have other goals, right? So at the team level, it's also more about not as much as, of course, doing the right thing is uh, important, which is the economic goals aspect, but doing it right is more kind of, you have more of a focus at the team level. So that's why I mentioned the four key metrics. You know, there are other metrics as well. It's about understanding how the, you're going to use those as your goal, right? Um, and then at the personal level as well. So you, you, at a business level to answer your question, see what are the underlying economic variables that are making this initiative happen. Okay. Does that yeah. answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I have a question, but yeah, I was just going to say I don't have a question, but I wonder if uh, you're also reading some of the chat messages which are coming in. Out there. Yeah, I'm just having a look. I'm just having a look. Hey, uh, Javier, can you hear me, guys? Uh, much? Hello, Javier. Yes, I can. Nice, nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see you. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I just want to say uh, I'm happy to to see you and to 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 hear you. It's always inspiring to me. Uh, as an IL coach, and especially because I'm a former co-student, so I, I am very proud and very happy to see that you're in the same uh, way, in the same culture, 
So um, um, this is Thank very you. inspiring to, to me. Uh, so I just want to say hey and, and, and to say hello. Thank you, Javier. Nice to see you. It's nice been a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me know if you come to Barcelona. Well, when we can travel. We will come soon. We are itching to come to Barcelona. But as soon as they let us in, we'll be there. And then I'll let you know. It'll be good to catch up. Yeah, it would be great. Thanks. See you. Well, Thanks. Who's not itching to go to Barcelona, right? <laughs> <laughs> Rishal, okay. you had a question. No, I just wanted to see if, uh, to Sapan's point, right? If you saw some of the messages in chat, but uh, yeah, one of the things that was said is goals must always be measurable. Is that something you agree with? Yes, 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 of course. Uh, otherwise, how do you know whether you, you are going somewhere towards them or not? Of course. I mean, this is actually one of the things that I, wouldn't, I didn't talk about is things like OKRs, right? You know, these objective key results. Key results is a very important part because, you know, you can have a goal, but if you don't know how you, how you are, the way you're going towards achieving it, then it's actually very difficult to chart your path, right? So measures are extremely important, especially that allow you to see progress through that, into that goal, towards that goal rather, right? So yes, and that's where actually in the DevOps thing that I showed you, the first way of DevOps is to create flow, right? The second way of DevOps is to amplify feedback. And the way you amplify feedback is by looking at the measures that will get you towards your goals and, and making sure that they are amplified, that they are well understood by the whole organization. The other comments are all about musics and playlists. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Important stuff, that too. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. In fact, very important. Uh, I actually listened to, uh, there are a bunch of playlists on Spotify called Focus and those kind of things. And I listen to uh, Baroque music as well when I am trying to concentrate. And it really puts me, especially when I'm doing something that that is necessary, but could be, get a bit boring like you know writing a big document or reading uh, a great big contract and and you know this really helps it really creates that concept of flow and you are doing this you're focused on this but you're you kind of also a bit um, in a way you're you're in a in a different type of state you go into that state that actually helps you both concentrate but also do the things that you otherwise might find boring. Great. And I see Parvati has unmuted and been trying to uh, speak. Parvati, go ahead. <laughs> hey, thank you. So really interesting session, Mash. Uh, thank you for that. Um, just, uh, thank you. just one thing popped up. Yeah, popped up in my mind. Um, I was thinking about you know, realigning yourself as in you have your set goals and your focus, you know, you've been working on the projects you've been working on, but then, you know, after um, quite a bit of efforts that you've put in, quite a bit of focus, and then something happens, which is not in your control, um, it could be, you know, uh, economic variables or something else that you really didn't foresee happens and you, you've been forced to work on something else uh, and drop the initial project altogether. So this challenge or this disruption that has happened, how, you know, what would uh, the, the proper way to deal with that be? I mean, I can understand, you know, you, you, you start from scratch again, but is there anything else you would um, sort of add to that? So, you know, as I mentioned, you know, in the example of that guy, right, you know, the, the sprinklers could come on and ruin his pot or he might, you know, I don't know, the phone might go off and, you know, uh, he's yeah. losing concentration and breaks the thing. And all these things can happen. 
uh, actually in the psychological state flow, they talk extensively, he talks extensively about happiness. And it's about, they talk about cultivating happiness. It's actually, you know, I, I it's not the first time that someone says it, but it's a state of mind. And it's how you achieve, uh, how you tackle or confront those situations which are actually disappointing because your expectations were set in a particular direction and and that thing did not happen or or something came in the way that was outside your control. And state of mind is really important. How you perceive that and how you react to that actually determines your happiness and not, not the event itself. Makes sense, thank you. Great, and we're up on time as well, Nash. So I think we can wrap things up and uh, thank you again. You know, I think this, what you talked about really will help uh, help us look at all of these things that we know about, right? We know about having a lot of focus when we're working. We know about uh, fast feedback, but how that's really helping us in our lives and in our work. Um, thank you for this additional insight into that. So um, You're welcome. it was Fantastic, fantastic having you here. And thanks everyone for joining as well. Thank you for listening. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, Mesh. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Mesh. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Same.